Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Mary has said, I'm Amanda Fuller. I direct our Texas Coast and Water Program at the National Wildlife Federation. I'm based in Austin. It is a real pleasure to be presenting to you all this morning. I grew up in the Houston area and my dad was a teacher, coach, assistant principal in ALEAF ISD for uh, almost 30 years. And my mom similarly was a teacher in ALEAF and KDISD for also uh, close to 30 years. So it's just really personal to me to, to get to interact with a group of teachers in the Houston area. And I am just so appreciative of everything you've been through um, as educators and individuals in the region in recent years. So you all are familiar with National Wildlife Federation at this point, but I do want to just add in here that we are the, the country's largest conservation organization. Uh, we're a big tent science driven group. Uh, we have state based affiliate organizations across the country. And most people come to know NWF through the Eco Schools program, our Ranger Rick and other magazine publications. We have a big gardening for wildlife program. Houston as a city is actually a certified wildlife habitat, which is great. And through our conservation policy work, which is what I work on. So today I get to talk to you all about resilience. And uh, I really just couldn't think of a more fitting topic for the moment that we're all in right now. So let me share with you our agenda. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about climate impacts in Houston, what we know, where we think we're headed, um, what is resilience, we can have a broad discussion about that, talk about mitigating flood impacts and ways that we promote doing that through green and natural infrastructure, uh, community benefits and how to center equity uh, when you're conducting projects, and examples of natural infrastructure, which hopefully will be useful when the students move into that phase of the project. So climate impacts in Houston. Living in Houston, you all are definitely experts on the lived experience of localized climate change impacts. So your city is also becoming a champion for science and information being put into the hands of the public. Public awareness and education about climate change is an important factor in a city's potential to be resilient. So recently the city released a new report, and this is just a screen capture of the um, cover of it. It's the, called the Climate Impact Assessment for the City of Houston. So some of the information that's included in this report um, is observed changes over the last 50 years. So we know that the Southern Great Plains and the Gulf Coast have highly variable climate with frequent weather extremes. Um, and so according to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as of July of this year, so not including Laura yet, um, the state of Texas had experienced 119 climate and weather events since 1980 that caused at least $1 billion worth of damage each. And that is more than any other state in our country. We know the region's temperature is changing. In 2011, for example, if you all remember our record breaking drought that we experienced, um, that drought killed over 300 million trees across the state of Texas, including about half of the trees in Houston's Memorial Park. We also know that the region's precipitation is changing and that storms and hurricanes are being affected. So long-term, hurricanes are not becoming more frequent, although it may seem that way. However, they are being altered by increasing temperatures and in other important ways. So observational data shows that hurricanes are intensifying faster, they are becoming stronger on average, and they're also becoming bigger and slower. And then we all know that the sea level is rising. So in the Houston-Galveston region, land subsidence is caused by compaction of silts and clays below the land surface due to groundwater withdrawals. And as a result, the relative rate of sea level rise in the area is among the highest in North America, second only to Louisiana. And that's information from the USGS in that report. And then I wanted to show you this neat tool. Um, it's uh, hosted by NOAA. And I've got a link on there um, for you to access it. It might be a neat tool to pull up in a classroom setting to just view historical hurricane activity. 
and I just typed in Houston and this is what came up. Um, but you could type in Galveston and get different results and just really take a look at the region. So we know kind of why we're more vulnerable to storms in the Houston area. Well, let's talk about where we're headed. Um, so over the rest of the century, projected future changes for Houston include longer, hotter summers, which will um, increase our energy demand to cool buildings. Longer multi-day heat waves. So when you hear, you know, on the radio or on the news, parts, you know, sensitive populations stay indoors on these days, we're going to have more of those. More 100 degree plus days and more 80 degree plus nights. So we won't cool down as much. And a decrease in summer precipitation and an increase in fall precipitation. So now that I've got everyone feeling overwhelmed, let's talk about um, solutions. And I wanna focus on resilience in particular. So what does resilience mean to you? And I say, think broadly. With so much going on in our world right now, difficulties that um, educators are experiencing, you know, this word likely carries a lot of meaning to you. Um, so I, we can unmute ourselves and just share for a minute or two uh, what, what this word conjures for us. So I'll pause and let you just shout out. Ability to bounce back. Bounce back. Mm -hmm. Ability to withstand stress. Flexibility in overcoming challenges. Well, I'm going to pop up a word cloud that I found. A lot of what you all were um, saying is included in here. I showed, I chose this word cloud because when you Google resilience word clouds, you get all kinds of uh, neat results. Um, but I chose this one because I wanted to think about it in a community um, setting. So for me, words that pop out in this are bounce, which someone mentioned, um, idea, leadership, grow, education, and vision. After Harvey, resilience became the name of the game. And for today's purposes, we're going to narrow in a little bit and think about this in terms of climate resilience, including being resilient to floods in particular. So Resilience for, for NOAA is defined as the ability to withstand and bounce back after hazardous events, such as hurricanes, coastal storms, and flooding, rather than simply reacting to impacts. And I like to put this spin on it. National Wildlife Federation changes that just slightly to say bounce forward after these events. Because really, when an ecosystem has been altered, we use words like restore or bounce back, but that's not actually true in the real sense of that. You can't really go back to the way things were. You have to move forward. Um, so for us, resilience and climate resilience in particular involves being proactive, setting the right policy and infrastructure in place before events happened, or at least not waiting for them to happen to inspire our action. It's about recognizing that our natural resources and our communities are worth the advanced investment to protect our way of life, our economies, and our children's future. And I would encourage you all to talk to students about the word resilience and have them talk about what it means to them personally before we put that um, emphasis on climate and flooding. And I think that's important because when we identify what's personal to us about resilience, then we'll each you know, fight harder to achieve that vision in our communities. And I really like this quote. Um, it was less than a year after Hurricane Harvey, our, the former judge of Harris County at Emmett said this, um, how quickly we return to our previous condition should not be the measure of resilience. That may be the definition. The real recovery comes when we know lives are back to normal and we have taken steps to make similar future disasters less impactful. And the last thing I wanna say as we frame up our conversation of resilience is that there's really three key elements to it in a community setting. And you can't have one working well without the other. And so those are cultural and social benefits, economic benefits and environmental benefits and factors. Um, everything is interconnected. 
So let me turn to um, flood mitigation. So now we have our resilience framing in mind, and I wanna dig in on this topic a little bit more. So there's a growing interest in alternatives to what we call conventional approaches or traditional approaches or great infrastructure. Those are all terms you may have heard. Those are things like levees, seawalls, um, cemented bayous, channelization. Um, more and more, some of this great infrastructure is being viewed as costly, aging, and increasingly unreliable. Whereas healthy natural systems are cost effective, adaptive to disturbances, and they provide numerous co-benefits. And they have this really unique ability to stack benefits over time. So when these projects go into the ground or a space is preserved, they are going to continue to provide benefits on day one and grow those benefits over time. Um, whereas typically with a traditional infrastructure project, the best you're gonna see those is the day that they go in the ground. So natural infrastructure is another term I wanna be introducing here. So that refers to natural systems, for example, wetlands, forests, and coral reefs that provide essential services and benefits to society, like flood protection, erosion control, and water purification. And we think of natural infrastructure really as an umbrella term. So inside of that includes ecosystem services, green infrastructure, nature-based defenses, et cetera. There's a whole lot of different terms out there. Natural infrastructure is a good way to just kind of address all of it in one term. And I wanna give you some examples um, of natural infrastructure to help illustrate these points. And I'm gonna show you um, natural defenses for floods as well as for coastal hazards because Houston is considered a coastal city and I think it's important context to have, especially with Galveston Bay in your backyard. So in terms of inland floods, approaches include floodplain and watershed restoration, um, levee setbacks, dam removal, and wetland and forest restoration. Urban and suburban communities have a range of green infrastructure options, including rain gardens, the application of permeable pavement to reduce surface flooding and polluted stormwater runoff. A good example is in Portland, Oregon. They've installed a whole series of something called green streets. And these streets have the potential to manage as much as 40% of the city's annual runoff. Of course, we also need to underscore the importance of policies and programs to protect natural floodplains from development and help move people out of harm's way through voluntary buyout programs. This has been an important approach in areas that have experienced repetitive flood losses. And I know in your area, the Harris County Flood Control District is taking on major voluntary buyout programs in real time. So you may be hearing about that in the news. Um, and then in coastal areas, restoration of coastal wetlands, beaches, dunes, coral and oyster reefs, these have all proven immensely effective in reducing damages during hurricanes. Living shorelines, which refer to a range of shoreline stabilization techniques to reduce erosion through the use of vegetation or a combination of vegetation and other natural materials, have proven less costly to maintain and often more effective in reducing storm damage compared to features like bulkheads. All you have to do is take a trip to Galveston Bay to see some really great examples of living shoreline projects. And as is the case with inland flooding, again, protecting these coastal areas from development, moving people out of harm's way, this is essential to reducing our risks now and in the future as sea levels rise and hurricanes become more intense. So earlier this summer, National Wildlife Federation released a new report. It's called the Protective Value of Nature and it provides a review of scientific literature highlighting the effectiveness of natural infrastructure to reduce risks from weather and climate related hazards. So this report covers a range of hazards, but it also includes inland flooding and coastal hazards. Um, and it's about how natural infrastructure can play a role in mitigating each of these hazards. So it's a summary of what we know just beyond the anecdotal in a rapidly growing field. And I think it's being made available to you all as a resource. So a couple of points I wanted to highlight in here 
is that natural and nature-based approaches can be equally or more effective than conventional approaches. Um, an acre of wetlands can typically store one to one and a half million gallons of floodwaters. That's immense. Um, and according to the Greater Houston Area Flood Mitigation Consortium, where watersheds remain undeveloped, acquisition of land along the bayous and creeks is a cost-effective flood mitigation tool. So you don't always have to have some major dirt turning project. You might just conserve or preserve what's there and keep it undeveloped for these benefits. Um, we often talk about financial savings from natural infrastructure, which is really powerful information, especially when you're trying to influence a decision maker. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what do these projects do for communities near them? Green infrastructure, urban greening projects like green roofs, resilient parks and greenways, rain gardens, detention basins and canals are often hailed as ways to protect cities against climate change impacts. These measures include stormwater management and mitigation of hazards like flooding and the urban heat island effect, which is something you also experience in the Houston area. As such, green infrastructure projects often require lower operating and repair costs than gray infrastructure projects. And so in addition to serving as an adaptation measure, urban greening is portrayed as accruing economic and social value and benefits. So for example, new green spaces can uh, contribute to increased property values, economic growth and business investment while offering recreational access, environmental learning, tighter social ties, strengthen civic networks and social capital, and overall improved health. However, anytime we're talking about communities and investments in communities, we have to talk about equity. So <clears throat> we know that investments in infrastructure, including flood mitigation infrastructure, are lower in low income zip codes and higher in high income zip codes. We know that historically underserved communities have a harder time bouncing back from a disaster and they sometimes never do. And we know that natural disasters widen the income gap between rich and poor. In all three of these points, there is data backing up that all three of these points are true in Houston post Hurricane Harvey. So how do we tackle that as involved community members? Right now, there are several large and novel sources of funding at play that do mandate a threshold of investments in low and moderate income communities. So organizations like mine are taking um, an aggressive approach to this and trying to influence decision makers to focus on these communities when they're developing project ideas. In Harris County in particular, you may have heard of something called the Harris Thrives Resolution. Um, this was something that was passed in, in concert with the flood bond that went through a couple years ago. Um, so there's really demonstrated political will and an engaged public beating the drum on equity in, in your community. So we've really never been better positioned to transform our Houston area communities and put them on a more resilient path for the future. There are lots of stars aligning in this moment. So let me give you some examples of natural infrastructure that hopefully you'll find helpful. And I did wanna start with a coastal setting because like I said, Houston is considered a coastal city. So it's important context to have. In the McFadden National Wildlife Refuge, this is in Southeast Texas, um, a pilot project was, was implemented that restored three miles of dune ridge and nourished the beach in an area that is highly vulnerable to erosion and saltwater intrusion. And following the restoration, the site was almost immediately impacted by Tropical Storm Cindy, which was in June of 2017, and then again by Hurricane Harvey. The project su successfully protected inland areas from seawater inundation, during the storms by reducing the number of times that those dunes were overtopped. So aerial footage after Harvey showed the restored three miles intact, while the adjacent unrestored beach was impacted. And then in Florida, there's an area in front of Joe Rains Beach, which has experienced severe erosion with significant loss of beach area and vegetation, which was undermining an existing seawall. Sand used from a dredging uh, from dredging a nearby canal that was needed to be done 
uh, provided a platform for planting salt marsh. Uh, two small oyster reefs were constructed as part of the project. And in October of 2018, the area was stood impacts from Hurricane Michael, which was a category five storm. The high and low marsh plants have filled in and there are clamshell bags that are recruiting oysters with nearly 100% coverage. And in an urban setting, there's a great example in Washington DC called River Smart Homes. So this is an example of funding citywide green stormwater infrastructure. So eligible homeowners can subsidize one or more green features on their properties. And this has resulted so far in more than 6,500 installations across the district, which together retain an annual average of 3.4 million gallons of stormwater. So small projects in a collective um, project, big impact overall. And then this is a neat project in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. It's called the Northwest Resiliency Park where above ground flooding is reduced as rainwater is collected from the park and the streets into lushly planted discovery gardens that help store and filter water before being released to the Hudson River. The gardens provide access to natural systems that are no longer commonly found in Hoboken while boosting biodiversity in an urban community. And then deep below the ground, up to a million gallons of runoff is collected from sewer districts and then piped into a large tank infiltration system where it's stored and released once the outfall system has the capacity to handle that water. So then it reduces flooding and then the combined sewer overflows into the Hudson River. So keeping a lot of pollution out of the river. And then lastly, I'll just share with you some, some local examples for you all. Um, just examples along Bagby Street in Midtown um, and on Rice University's campus. So lots of rain gardens that absorb and filter runoff um, and bioswells and plantings and parking lot of a bank here and green roof and drainage channels and parking lots. So these are all um, good scale projects that you can implement kind of parcel by parcel. Um, so I'm gonna stop with that and just thank you for your attention and your time today. And I believe we can do some Q and A at this point. That would be great. Yeah, um, teachers, please ask any questions that you might have. We've got a few minutes for that before our next speaker. I did see one question in the chat box, Amanda, uh, which was, is there a specific organization within the city that puts together that um, climate assessment report? Oh yeah, so, um, and Marissa Ajo will be joining you all soon and she can probably speak to that in greater detail as well. But that report was put together um, by several entities with the city, with the Houston Advanced Research Center, HARC, and then part of the, the Rockefeller 101 Resilient Cities program. So there are a couple of um, logos at the bottom of that um, snapshot of the cover that you could check out. And if you just Google, I mean, this report was released um, a few days ago. So if you just kind of Google um, the title of it, it will pull right up for you and you can take a look. But it's out of the mayor's office. 